Hello, I'm Rob Hirschfeld, your host for the weekly Distance DevOps Lunch and Learn. This week, we have Paul Stack from Paluni talking about infrastructure as code, giving some great demos and pieces like that. If you are interested in speaking or know somebody who should speak at uh, this weekly event, it's informal, 45 minutes of discussion, learning, and whatever else our speakers want to throw at us. Uh, enjoy this week. Thanks. Okay, I promise I'm not going to make this like long and boring and lots of slides and stuff like this. Uh, <laughs> Sir, I didn't, I didn't like, mean to raise the bar on you. <laughs> it's okay. I'm I, about, like day long. This is, well, I'm this. sorry, but if you're not going to make it long and boring, I'm just going to leave. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I listened far. to what everyone said there and I've like removed even more slides. It's awesome. Okay, so, um, so my name is Paul Stack. I'm Stack72 on Twitter and I'm an engineer at a company called Pulumi. Pulumi is what I class as the new kid on the block of the infrastructure as code tools. It's been around a little while now. It's just hit 2.0 recently. And um, there's been like a lot of, uh, of movement in the area. But uh, today it was awesome that Rob was able to ask us to come on and show a little of what we have. Um, so it's important they understand first like that, that there's sort of like different levels or different variations of the the cloud transition so you have like v1 of the people who have just picked up their data center and moved it to the cloud like as a first step uh, you have other people who have gone a little step further and, and are sort of in a vm container sort of hybrid taking advantage of some of the the, the built-in style um services let's say like uh, aurora or something in, in amazon uh and then you have like people in v3 which is like what people class as like modern infrastructure or serverless infrastructures or microservices or, you know, cloud native or all these different words that people have for like their own sort of fully dynamic services of how things work. It's a mix of maybe containers using um, uh, an orchestration engine and a serverless setup. And then it actually uses mostly public cloud, but can even link back into their own private cloud and stuff like this. So there's like lots of different variants that people do on the, on the, like w when they deploy their, their systems into the cloud. And um, the, all tools out there sort of target all, all three pieces of these um, cloud transitions. So, but Pulumi, we try and specialize in the, in the V3 style infrastructure because we're able to take advantage of a lot more of like being able to build layers of abstraction and, 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 um, uh, and sort of reusable components than some of the other tools because we're actually using real languages and we're actually uh, being able to use the power of the language ecosystem. Um, so for us, we create our infrastructure in real languages. You can share your, you use your abstractions in your IDEs using your testing tools. We even support test-driven development right now, which I can show you a little bit in a, little, uh, a bit later. It's a CLI tool, like all the other tools, of course, which gives you the ability that you can preview the changes and integrate your CI CD pipelines. And then lastly, of course, because we are a SaaS by default, um, then you get the audit trail that goes with it. Now, it's very important to say we are a SaaS by default. We are not only a SaaS. So there is the ability that at any point you can swap from the SaaS to using an S3 backend or a GCP backend or console or artifact, any of the backends that are currently actually the Terraform supports, Pulumi also supports at the same time. And even um, that you don't even have to check it into anywhere other than local state and you can manage it yourself. So it's really important they understand that that's the difference. Pulumi is SaaS first, service first, and then we actually allow people to back that out if they don't want to use it. Now, we are also declarative. Even though we're in real languages, what you define in your Pulumi application is end state. Okay, so it will actually get you there. It just does it in a imperative manner using the, the, the applications that you write in. We have raw conditions and loops, of course, because we can take advantage of the language ecosystem in order to do it. We also have the same sort of style of multi-provider workflows where outputs of one provider can be inputs of another provider. Pulumi works on promises. Uh, because it works on promises, we actually don't need to know everything up front. It can actually resolve it uh, when it resolves the promise which means you can actually inject providers into the code further down the system. And you can actually see this, like you have an Nginx uh, config stored in an S3 bucket, and then that's the input of a Kubernetes um, deployment. We can package things uh, because again, we're real languages. You can take advantage of your packaging ecosystem. So Pulumi right now out of the box supports JavaScript and TypeScript. So the NPM ecosystem, it supports C sharp, F sharp and VB. So the, the .NET ecosystem, it supports Python. So we can use Pipey, and then lastly, we support Go, so we can take advantage of Go modules. So you can package them up and you can redistribute them as you need to. 
But one of the things that sort of enables us to go a little further is that we can start to take advantage of pre-existing libraries that have been created in the ecosystem already. So this is an advanced orchestration example where what we do is we deploy three uh, replicas of a Kubernetes um, deployment. Then we actually talk to Prometheus API using the Prometheus SDK. We monitor that the application is as expected for a period of time or whatever we determine in the code itself. And once we're happy, we can then continue the Pulumi run. In the same Pulumi run, you don't have to break it up into different runs and it will actually deploy the remaining 10 replicas of your system. I don't know why three replicas of 10 were chosen here, but this is just like the, the slides that were created. So we can very much sort of centralize a single workflow rather than having to do a single deploy, go into a monitoring system and then come back and then run another deployment that goes with it. And then lastly, as part of the, the 2.0, one of the things that we're very, very proud of is the fact that you can now fully test drive your infrastructure. Now, I, I do mean test driven in the respect of um, you, it, it will actually mock the responses from the cloud and you do not need any even credentials on your machine. This is an AWS example. We support mocking of any of our um, frameworks because effectively Pulumi knows when it's making a, a request to create a resource, update a resource, delete a resource, or even get a resource so we can mock any of those responses and at that point you can actually start to write the code which will allow you to to build your infrastructure without the uh the loop time or the development loop time of uh spinning the resources up to bring them back down so of course that's important when you're doing things like kubernetes or eks when it takes like 20 minutes to spin up a cluster it would be great if you could just do that in-house and actually not have to do it and then lastly, the huge area that we believe that we're different from everyone else is that we try and have a secret engine by default. So using some of the other tools in the ecosystem right now, you have to wrap those tools with other tools in order to actually um, take advantage of the secret management. But Pulumi has a built in secret engine, which will allow you to deploy and store your secrets, not just for outputs, but it is actually stored throughout the state. I'm going to give a demo of that in a second. By default, if you're using the Pulumi SaaS, then it will enable Pulumi KMS, which is a KMS key that's designed specifically for your Pulumi project, excuse me, designated for your Pulumi project, but you can very easily swap in your own AWS KMS key, Azure uh, Key Vault, uh, Google KMS key, and we also support HashiCorp Vault. So it's, we're trying to promote that good security and good safety um, as we go along. So, that's enough for the slides. I told you, this is not a sales talk. So let's just go and um, have a look at what we do. So Pulumi is a CLI tool. And because it's a CLI tool, it actually offers us some, some hints about how we, how we work. It is interactive by default, uh, but of course you can switch that off to, to make it in a CI environment. But locally, it's actually quite useful because if I run the command Pulumi new, then Pulumi will tell us the types of applications that it can scaffold. Today we're going to do AWS TypeScript just because of the fact that it's quite simple and easy to understand what it's doing. It'll ask you for a project name, a project description, and a stack. A stack is a way of being able to deploy multiple instances of the same infrastructure to a cloud. So if we think of a stack being uh, an environment or each every individual developer can have their own stack and can iterate and test independently of each other. And then lastly, because it's deploying in the AWS, we can give it a, um, a, a region to deploy into. It'll take 25 minutes to install the dependencies because it's NPM. <laughs> I'm joking. It'll, it's, <laughs> it does, it, of course, like because of it's some of the libraries- 25 library, minutes to fix one if one changes. That's like, yes, that's the, that's the <laughs> it NPM does experience. actually um, download a lot of different things. But we have actually got a Pulumi application that has been scaffolded right now. I'm just going to open it. So my ID is just going to kick in the light, maybe. There we go. And we can actually see that there are a number of pieces. Let me just go into presentation mode. Uh, so the first thing that we have is, of course, we have all of our Node.js modules. Um, we have a git ignore. We have an index.ts, which we'll come to in a second. Our package file. Uh, pulumi.dev.yaml so that is the configuration for the dev stack a uh, pulumi.yaml that you can override other features that we don't need to talk about today so, but the most oh, important thing is sorry go on th yeah this was just generated by the template generator yes yes wow, okay. yes pulumi scaffold 
um, and we have support for a lot of different um, templates. So the templates are extremely easy. Um, and they are literally just placeholders, if you think of them as placeholders. But we have all of the major clouds in all of the different languages. Okay. Yeah, that's that's really helpful from a getting started perspective. It, it has everything that you need in order to get started. Okay, so then we bring in some imports, which are, think of these as like, Pulumi is like our helper libraries. AWS is access to the raw AWS provider libraries. And then AWS X, which we're probably not covered today. It's actually, we, we may have time to do it, depending on if I can get through this fast. So we can see that we can scaffold an S3 bucket and using our code, we can see that the constructor takes a name, it takes some arguments and it takes some options. And now we're just passing in a name of my bucket. So if I, in, in order to try and be secure, I use a tool called mchain. So people usually ask me, how does it read the credentials? It's actually reading them from my CLI, uh, from my, uh, my environment variables. In this case, it's using mchain. So, it won't store the credentials and, and there is no execution mode on your behalf. Pulumi is a run at will tool. Okay. So we get a plan of what it's going to do, but notice here is that it's actually named the bucket with a random prefix or a random suffix. So we try and auto name things by default to get us out of the problem in other where people have faced in other tools where they have to use lifecycle blocks around create by before destroy. We are create before destroy by default which means we try and auto name by default. We can of course turn that off. Each argument or each, each resource has an argument in there. It's usually name, but S3 for some reason is, um, it's actually comes up as a bucket. And now we're effectively overriding it. And again, we're able to see that it will use the strong name rather than and the auto-generated name because we've, we've effectively told Pulumi to turn that off. And it's a CLI driven tool, right? So it has its up, it has its read, it has its update, it has its delete, and it manages the state to go with it. So let me just show you what the state would be just to prove that we're not storing any secrets. I'm hoping that bucket has not been taken already. <laughs> <laughs> There's a chance it may well have. <laughs> That's the benefit of having the auto-generated names. That makes a lot of sense. Yes, yes, yes. And it, it makes a lot more sense even for things like launch templates, uh, you know, that, that uh, you don't have a direct name and uh, convention based on whereas a bucket name, you, you could have to use it in like a URL, for example. And we can actually have a look at the, the stack. Okay, we call it the stack. Our state is a stack. And... Um, we can see that it has all of the inputs and outputs required for the S3 bucket. Our IDs are very simple because it's based on the stack. It's based on the project name, the resource type, and then the name that, that you actually give it. So the my bucket name. So we can actually refactor till our heart is content and move things around into different packages and different things. And, you know, actually follow real software development practices of actually refactoring as we go. But notice we have outputs. There are no credentials in our output. Nice. and we have a secret provider and there are no credentials in our secret provider so we try and be secret by default now if i just delete that and then let's go to looking at something a little more interesting now i told you that we try and um we have a secrets provider built in i understand that i don't have a lot of time today and i can't go into a lot of different things but there's a couple of demos that i actually want to do okay so the first one is aws x in AWS X, we have managed to abstract a lot of the boilerplate code that would cause people that they would have to continually go and look up in documentation in Amazon or, um, you know, what is needed to run an entire VPC. It's the subnets, the route tables, the route table associations, the routes, the internet gateways, the NAT gateways, the gateway or the, the elastic IPs, all these different things. And we can actually say const. Uh, VPC equals new AWS X dot EC2 dot VPC. Notice I'm getting autocomplete the whole way through here. So, and I'm going to say uh, distance DevOps VPC. And I don't need anything else. I just need an empty argument. Now that looks like it's a single resource, but under the hood, that's actually a lot more resources because it's a layer of abstraction. It's a package that's been hidden away and we can actually have a look and see what it's going to do. So it's actually going to create 31 resources by default. 
So it will create two private subnets, two public subnets. It'll create the routes, the route table associations, the internet gateway. It'll create elastic IPs and NAT gateways for each of the private subnets. But it's a nice, simple way of being able to hide and, and demonstrate that Plumi has this idea where you can like wrap actual code into APIs that you can create nice, simplistic APIs against. Now, we can have a look at it like really simply where it extends this idea where you have a, Palo a Palumi component resource. And a Palumi component resource is, is like um, a wrapper class. If you think if you're a, a Terraform user, it would be similar to how a Terraform module works, but it's an actual API that can be used rather than just um, like packaging together resources. So it can be uh, like tested, it can be um, refactored, it can actually be reused in multiple ways. Now, I know that someone has actually created a nice demo of this, where um, this is actually somebody who works for Pulumi, of course. And uh, we, we uh, actually wrote the ability to, to demo a multi-cloud Kubernetes cluster that operations people could build and just give the developers the package that they could implement. And in 14 lines of code, developers can actually spin up an AKS cluster and an EKS cluster there and export the, uh, the cube config so that they can actually take advantage of, of cube control. And then inside the um, API, so we can actually wrap all of the logic that, that we have to wrap. So, you know, the private keys, the application service principles, the resource groups, the res um, virtual networks, the subnets. These are things that your operations team can actually abstract away from the developer. So the developer doesn't actually need to get into the nuts and bolts of understanding about the security um, aspect of, of trying to deploy a Kubernetes cluster or, or you know, all of the, the, the associated uh, pieces that go with that. So it's, it's a nice way of being able to abstract that away from each other. Any questions so far? I, I, I want to pull that back into something where you said it, that it was an API. So in those modules, when it's making the call, it's not just stringing together a whole bunch of, of code behind the scenes. It's actually able to call an API and say, you know, like you're creating your own component resource. You are exactly creating okay. your own component resource. It is not just stringing and, and doing all the different pieces because even inside the API, and I can go back to the other, other demo. Huh. Um, we can create, like, we have this idea where we can even force parentage so that um, inside our, our, our list of resources, we can even build up our own structure that we actually want it to be, that, you know, um, the Kubernetes cluster would actually be a child of whatever resource that needs to happen. So you can force your own convention on how actually things are deployed and the order in which they're being deployed. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm thinking through. Then, so, does that mean that you could create a layer of separation, so like an ops team could own that resource? Like that, that's basically what you're saying. So, because there, it's an API and a service, yep. there's an abstraction. Yeah. And you're saying, yep. hey, so I an need ops you to team, go do an this. ops team, okay. yeah, that's exactly right. An ops team could okay. deploy and or could build these component resource libraries, make them available on your internal packaging system. And the developers can pick up the new version of like actually real semver style packages that fit in their development workflow. Just do an npm install or a pipe um, install, and then they can actually write code against it. And and if the operations team updates it and they submit it to the service, then the developers don't even know that anything changed. They're just called. They it don't service. even know exactly that. Exactly so that. It truly is building an API service. Yes. Okay. Yes. That's yes. why it's a services first. That that addresses one of my biggest. So the state is actually managed at the service level. You're not worried about synchronizing state between all the developers' copies. Correct. It's a centrally managed um, state. Yes, that's correct. That's correct. That's a big deal. Okay, and then I'm I'm just I, I thought the last thing that I can do because I don't have a lot of extra time is I really wanted to show you about the secret engine. Okay, because this is I think that something that we as a I, I certainly don't, when I'm giving talks, make a big enough deal about this, about why this is so important, because I'm an ops um, person, and I really believe that we should understand more about what we're doing here and you know, actually showing people that this is a first-class thing for us. Yeah. And the first, like, I, there's a, 
a, a random library that just allows you to create some random um, strings and random, you know, passwords and stuff like that, that just, just for demo purposes. So I can say const my password equals new random dot random password. I'm going to say my password and I'm going to give it a length of uh, 30 characters and I want it to have special characters as well. Okay. So, and then what we can do is we can export it uh, const my password result equals my password dot result. I know it's stored in result because I've written this, like given this demo a hundred times, right? <laughs> Like, and I can say, pull me up. And this is now tends to be what most tools do. Okay. So if I pull me up, let's run it in CI mode, like with no like prompt and skipping the preview. So it just goes and like actually creates the resource and nothing else. Then what usually happens in all tools, even like is you get the random string, right? That comes out, not just on the, on the UI, but we get the random string that comes out in the, in the state file hmm. and uh, because of that, like, you know, you could effectively be leaking passwords. Let's say you're creating an RDS cluster in Amazon. When you're creating an RDS cluster in Amazon, you have to give it an initial root password or you give it a root password. And then usually there has to be like another tool comes behind and changes that password. So that, because it's, it's like stuck in state file. <laughs> so in the third yeah. um, uh, parameter that's passed in is we have this idea of, a secret engine, okay? And we can say additional secret outputs, and I can say the result. So this parameter name, it's stringly typed right now, but that may well change in the future, of course. This parameter name right here, result, we can push the result through the secret engine, and even when it comes out on the UI and in the state, it'll actually be encrypted. So, you know what? I, I want to do them side by side, so let me just show you oh, the smart. existing the existing yeah. one and the new one so that you can see exactly what it does. Let's remove that. And I'm going to be lazy and copy and paste. I apologize. And um, so what we will do right now is we effectively have two secrets, one that's in the unencrypted format and one is in the encrypted format. And we can actually see that it has secret here. So it's not just wrapped in a secret block. It's actually a fully created secret object in the code. Mm -hmm. And it is passed around as a secret object. And we can see that because Pulumi stack export, we can even see that stores the result as the ciphertext. And that's the ciphertext after encrypting it using the KMS key. Right. So even if your state file gets compromised, it's le of course it's still a concern, but it's less of a concern because it's not in raw plain text. Um, it is encrypted in some way. And um, now of course, I, I still wouldn't suggest that you just like post them on the internet. I would still like ensure caution that goes with that, but it's there. <laughs> now, yeah. as part of that, we can also set configuration values for use within our applications. So like, let's say I wanted to read a configuration value from at the Pulumi, Pulumi, and the way you would do that is you would say const config equals Pulumi dot config. Okay, so that'll get you into the config block, and at that point you can say uh, my secret equals and it's const. I apologize, I'm in JavaScript. Is config dot require? Come on, require a secret, and the secret will be called my DB password. Okay. And this tends to be the way it goes right now. Why do you not like that? Yeah, we need a new in there. I apologize, there we go. Now let's create this MyDB password. MyDB password, and let's say my password, one, two, three, four. And what happens is, and the same in other tools, is it actually will store the password in plain text. Now, of course, that's not great, so we can instruct Pulumi to push it through the secret engine. And at that point, it actually stores it as a ciphertext. And just in order to actually show you what actually comes out the other side, to show you that it comes the whole way through, my secret value equals my secret. Okay. And if I pull me up, 
then it's passed through as a secret the entire way through. And of course it can be used as, uh, and then, okay. And then, and then when you're ready to retrieve it, you have a way to say, Hey, give me this password, but decrypt it. Exactly. 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 In fact, like, because I, I have access to the secret engine, I can Pulumi stack export show secrets because I have the key. Um, but like if anybody else in the team doesn't have the key to encrypt it, we can actually get the plain text output, which will allow you to change it to a different project or, you know, uh, check that it still works or anything like that. So we can decrypt it because we have access to the KNS. Right. You have to be able to. Yeah. Yeah. So it's there. It's, it's, it's able to be done. So for us, it's like a, a real first class citizen. They have that secret engine built in by default. Now, just to show you what we support, if I say help, then you'll see that you can init a Pulumi stack using a secrets provider. That's your own KMS key, Azure Key Vault, GCP KMS, and HashiCorp Vault. Nice. So that is like a 15 or a 20 minute introduction to Pulumi. Um, like I just scratched the surface of what you can do with it. Um, but I'm hoping that it's piqued some people's interest and I'm more than happy to answer some questions. I have an immediate question on the secrets, but I would, I would then love to open the floor up to a broader, uh, <laughs> broader thing. We, we have as much time as you need. So please, please, um, please ask what you need to. Um, yeah. So when, when, with the secret stuff, what you're showing makes perfect sense, right? You're not accidentally leaking secrets, but there's still times when you're in the script, you're going to need to, you know, decode the secret to use it. Um, and I'm assuming those those end up captured in logs somewhere. Have you figured out a way to make it so that when you're you're running a script that has, is used the decrypted secret that it's you know that you're not accidentally leaking at that point? We, Got we it. hit this um, all the time. I've been trying to figure out a good answer. So um, what we can actually do is let me show you. Um, so any. Pulumi works on promises, right? And it, it uses this idea of Pulumi inputs and Pulumi outputs. And the type of a Pulumi secret actually comes out mm -hmm. as an output. So that secret doesn't need to be decrypted before it's passed to the next resource. Uh, mm -hmm. Pulumi inside the resource will actually decrypt it before it uses it. You can actually pass it as a secret at any point. So let me show. Hmm. Um, I'll give you an example. Const AWS bucket equals new AWS dot S three dot bucket. I'm going to say my secret demo and I can say bucket name. Actually, you know what? I need to import it. Star as AWS from at Pulumi slash AWS. And, uh, here I can actually say the bucket name will be my secret. And that is like, it will tell you if it doesn't match it because here it's, oh, there we go. See, right now I can actually pass that secret in as a bucket name and nowhere will that be in the state that that is a secret. Huh. So it's fully typed. It's not using um, castings around. It's actually passing it around as a real secret object, which means that we don't have to like, you know, only encrypted for logs. It's only encrypted as, as exactly when it's talking to the API. Of course, if you trace the API calls to the cloud at that point, it'll be, you know, dependent on how the API call itself, uh, if you need to pass it as base 64 or whatever, you could potentially see it as a, as a hashed value, or it could be like a plain text value in itself. Yeah. That's, that's the thing I've been trying to figure out. For, for the stuff that we do, we're, we're like building a bash script and then you get the, everything's encrypted until the bash script needs it. And then it's yeah. a bash script, but then that ends up getting, in, you know, can get thrown in the logs. And so I'm looking for ways to obfuscate. I'm going to give you one more thing that I'm hoping I'll sell you on Pulumi. Please. And it's uh, Jason. Um, like I am management and Amazon is painful because it's Jason, right? So let's say comp my role equals new AWS dot I am dot role. Okay, we can say my role. And we know that a role, usually in person, I would give a prize to if anyone could come up and write out what the assume role policy for a role is. Oh and I God. think in, yeah. in like all of the conferences, only one person has ever got it right. <laughs> and, um, but then all I have to do is say assume role policy for a principal, pass in a service, and the service is uh, ec2.amazon.com. 
aws.com. And that actually under the hood will uh, relate to the correct JSON that you pass to the API. So no JSON is harmed in the making of this resource. Yeah, that's much safer. That's cool. Yeah. So yeah, um, I hope that answers your question about the, um, the secrets. I definitely, that, that was not something I was expecting to see. I'm going to shut up and let other people ask questions if they want, because I, I'll, otherwise I'll just take the last 10 minutes of the meeting. So other, other people with questions? I have one and I may have missed this, so I apologize, but can you can, maybe, maybe I didn't understand it, but is there native support for S3 for, for state storing or no? Yes, there is. I apologize. I should have actually demoed that. Um, so if I look at Pulumi and I say, Pulumi, uh, who am I? And uh, it will actually tell me um, that it's me, the user is logged into the back end. This back end is our SAS, mm -hmm. but I can Pulumi login, dash dash cloud URL, and I can say S3 and the bucket name. Oh, cool. Okay. And it will like, uh, and then of course, like, even the login help um, will will tell you it has G uh, cloud support, Azure Blob storage. It has local storage. You see, it even have local and stuff like that. So you don't you need to use the SaaS um, if you don't want to. Right. Have you had clients who have gone from the SaaS to a local and and? We do not track people who use the open source version um, okay. because it's open source and it's free to use, and we don't we don't like we don't try and infringe and, and like have checkpoints back to understand. The only thing that we understand is there is someone using it um, because it does a, a check in with Pulumi to see if a new version is available, but it doesn't pass um, the back end or any information about what you're using. gone quiet that means yeah. people are usually they're not sold on it <laughs> no I'm, well, I'm i'm just trying not to because as rob knows i will take over and chat about security and uh where uh, this makes me nervous a bit um for 106 minutes so i'm trying not to do that <laughs> do you, know, you know what like i i'm i'm like really happy to um talk about the security side of it um if you, if you want to set someone up and, and, and be interested in it because like what we want to do is we want people to be happy with it. We want people to not be concerned about all the different parts of it. And um, if, if security is a concern, then that's something that we need to address as a team. And I'm, I'm always happy to talk about it. Now, I may not give you the answers that you want, and I'll be honest with you, but at least I can, you know, understand what it is you're looking to um, know and, and what potentially is, is the security that you're worried about, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So please like direct any questions you have to me about it. And I'm, I'll, I'll like, even if I can't answer them, I can put you in contact with the, the CTO. And yeah. um, cause we're going through SOC two right now. Uh, so we're actually reviewing a lot of our processes. You just said the magic early. words to my ear. <laughs> SOC two? Yeah, I got our company certified last year. It's my, it's my, been my so passion for the couple of We're going left. through it right now, especially with regards to our SaaS and all of our processes and access to our accounts. So it's something that we're like very hot on at the minute. And um, as you can imagine, like uh, as questions from the SOC 2 um, audit happens, there'll be changes going on all the time to make sure that external companies are happy using it. Yeah, that's uh, exactly what we, what I had to do. Did you do a type one before or are you doing I, a type one now? I, I'm going to be honest with you. I stay away from that right now okay. because um, <laughs> I, I am, I'm the only person, uh, there's actually only two of the entire Pulumi team that are outside uh, North America. Um, so I'm in Ireland and uh, one of my colleagues is in Amsterdam. So, or well, he's in the Netherlands, I apologize, not Amsterdam. So we're actually like able to just have a much more freedom about what we need to do um, away from the pro. We just need to implement like what we're told to implement, which is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. What's, what's a good starting path? Like should is starting with the SAS the easier the easier path and is there something that you know like if if I wanted to try and you know, create so it's something? a great question um, the, the, so if you're a, a single developer 
and you don't need any team functionality, the SaaS is 100% free. Okay, and you can use that even in a production environment and you can actually build like commercial software on top of it. The, you, you have to start paying for Pulumi when you want like the locking feature when multiple people in the team are trying to um, interact with the state at the same time so you don't uh, clobber each other. So the SaaS is, the reason it's by default is that it's, it's very good to get you started with. You don't need to worry about what you have to do to set up an S3 bucket or more importantly, the permissions that your S3 bucket needs because you know too many people are just too happy just creating a bucket that's open to the world. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to enforce those, um, those ways of working. So we're like, you know, use the SaaS and then if you really want to, you can un unload the SaaS and actually start to use your own, um, your own software that goes with it. We have created a repo, uh, which is called the Infrastructure as Code Workshop. And it's like self-paced labs um, it, like this is like a side project for me right now. And you can see in Amazon, we have C Sharp, Go, Python, and TypeScript. And we have Azure um, in C Sharp and Python. And these, these are all being built up all the time so that these are getting started flows. And these sort of just like assume the SaaS by default. But we are going to add work in here to say, if you want to log out of the SaaS and do this in an S3 bucket, then here's what you would have to do. Makes sense. The SaaS seems seems fine from that perspective. I'm I'm trying. To I think for through. just getting started yeah. and like testing it out and trialing it out, the SaaS will work for you. And then like if if it has to be a conversation with um, around the functionalities of the SaaS versus the open source backends, then like there, there's documentation that we have as a company. I I try not to get involved in that because of the fact I'm an engineer, right? I I'm not I'm not here to sell you something. I'm here to show you why I think it's actually kind of good. And then if you see the value in it, then, you know, wh whatever happens in the future happens. Right. Right. No, that makes sense. I, for me, right. I've been using Terraform in the past. I, I know how to build a plan and, and sort of slam a plan into a very, you know, very narrow use case. Um, it would be nice to be able to sit down and say, all right, I've done the same thing in Pulumi. I've created, you know, usually my plans are like, I just need some VMs and then I want to tear them down again. Yeah. Um, now, something that may be interesting for you if you have already, like if you already have existing infrastructure, um, of course, w we know that we have to exist in this ecosystem. We know that it's not us or them, okay? It's, it's just, it's not the way it works all the time. It has to be a case of different teams. We'll use different tools and mix it up. So you can actually use your existing Terraform state with Pulumi. So you can give it like um, a get um, read-only token to your existing state backend. Pulumi can go and read the state. It will never be able to update it because it's in like a, a read-only token. And then based on that, you can build new Pulumi applications or new Pulumi infrastructure on top of your existing infrastructure. What, what about like taking a plan file that I have and importing a plan file into code? Do you have a converter for that? We do not have it for a plan, for a, like a plan, but okay. there, of course, there is a tool that will convert an entire Terraform project to a Pulumi project. And it's not just TypeScript anymore. It will support all of the, um, the work because it has HCL2 support right now. And um, that will actually generate like the real scaffolded Pulumi applications based on what your existing Terraform is. And, and if I take that, do I, is there, what's the equivalent of sharing a plan um, for in Pulumi speak? So if, if I wanted to publish something that other people could play with, what would I publish? Uh, you would publish a Pulumi stack and then people would be able to like uh, play with the stacks. Okay, so they could take, basically take their SaaS portal, drop a stack yep. in it, okay. Yep, that's exactly it. And because if it's a SaaS, could I publish a stack right on the SaaS and just let people reuse it? Uh, potentially, yes, I believe so. Like you would, you would have, like create this component resource, and people would just be able to like reuse that in order to like rebuild their um, like the the resources under it. Interesting. Okay, I've I've been playing with uh, Linode and their stack scripts, which um, are both awesome and frustrating at the same time. <laughs> and uh, cause they're sort of cloud and nitty, but I can share them and then people can reuse them. Um, but they don't do what you do. So they don't let me build a resource. They just let me post configure it. And so I'm looking for a way that I can hand somebody a, yeah, 
run this, it'll build you a little cluster and you're, you're good to go. And when you're ready to tear it down, you can just run, you know, undo it and you're, you're, you're back. Yeah, totally I understand. Can't do, I can't do it in Terraform either. Terraform doesn't do the post configuration, and so there's all this. Like, yeah, so this is this is where we differ, and I'm not going to say we're better or worse than this. We actually are just differ because we use promises. We can mm -hmm. actually like um, have much later registration of resources and providers than you can in in, in Terraform, as an example, because mm -hmm. in Terraform it has to build the entire DAG, the DAG being the the graph up front, right. whereas Pulumia doesn't need to do that. makes a lot of sense. That is an important distinction. Cool. All right, Paul, we are at the top of the hour. So this has been fantastic. Thank you. And I do appreciate the live demos. Uh, they add a lot hey, of it's, space to it's, it's no problem. Um, if anybody has any other questions um, or things that I didn't cover, you can tweet me at Stack72. And um, I'm more than happy to like jump on shorter calls or record short videos that I can post for people. And um, or if there's anything like Sherry, you asked around the security side of it that I haven't given enough information on, like more than happy to give more substance in that area as well. Now, yeah, I'm gonna, I, I just followed you. So I'm definitely gonna reach out and chat with you about that. Cause I-, I... Excellent. And, I, and I'll, I'll introduce you to the VP of engineering and the CTO if there's like, like questions that I really can't answer or you know things that I wouldn't be confident saying in an open forum. <laughs> <laughs> and let them and let them answer it. <laughs> let them dig their hole. Exactly. <laughs> thank you so oh, much. Thank you. This always. was great. Good way thank you all very much, uh, folks. I hope you all stay safe and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Stay too. Thank you, everyone. Take care. See you next week. Take care. Bye bye. I know.